Welcome to a discussion about ending our cultural obsession with ambition and the American dream. Bootstrapped, Liberating Ourselves from the American Dream is the new book by Alyssa Quart. She is the author of four previous books of fiction, including Squeezed, Why Our Families Can't Afford America, and Branded, The Buying and Selling of Teenagers, and two books of poetry, most recently Thoughts and Prayers. She is the executive director of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project and writes for publications including the Washington Post, Time, and the New York Times, and created the award-winning podcast Going for Broke. Her honors include an Emmy, an SPJ Award, and a Neiman Fellowship. She lives with her family in Brooklyn. Rainsford Stauffer is an author, journalist, speaker, and Kentuckian. She is the work in progress columnist for Teen Vogue and wrote a column for Catapult called Gold Stars. Her work has also appeared in the New York Times, Scalawag, Dame Magazine, Vox, and other publications. She is the author of An Ordinary Age and is a 2022-2023 Rosalind Carter Fellow for Mental Health Journalism. In her upcoming book, All the Gold Stars, Reimagining Ambition and the Ways We Strive, Stoffer looks at how the cultural, personal, and societal expectations around ambition are driving the burnout epidemic by funneling our worth into productivity, limiting our imaginations, and pushing us further apart. Stoffer discovers the common factors driving us all and provides ways for us to reconceive ambition as more collective, imaginative, and rooted in caring for ourselves and each other. So welcome so much, Alyssa and uh, Rainsford. Again, I'm recording you again because we started our conversation um, a little earlier, but now we are actually being recorded. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. It's great to be here. I love your, I love it. Yes, you've done a lot of good stuff on domestic work. I feel like I've read, I've read, and workers' co-ops actually. Yeah. Um, co-ops are a big uh, a big source of uh, interest and hope for our readers. And that's one of the many solutions that you put forward in your book. Um, we say that we practice what we do as solutions journalism. And I found both of your books just chock full of solutions of different kinds, which was very helpful, especially as we are at this um, point in time where we are, um, I don't know whether we're going to just repeat history now or whether um, in the age of pandemic, we're going to actually do something different. We certainly have a need to um, go in a, a different direction. So that I wonder if you can um, just give us a little bit of the historic background. Sure. And, um, and your the title of your book, Bootstrapped. And Liberating still- ourselves from the American dream. And I rem- I talked to somebody at like a kind of NPR person. They're like, that's a dangerous subtitle. And I've sometimes thought, oh, it should have been something a little more like reclaim, reclaiming the American. But I was like, nah, you know, um, because because it really, I, 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 the American dream I'm arguing for is an, is partially the old American dream, which was coined um, in 1931 as something more communitarian and more uh, open to collective possibility. But it's also uh, what we, I think what we need to do is we need to be thinking, how do we get past this story about uh, doing everything on our own, about ambition, achievement, money, about people, great, uh, supposedly great wealthy men having no origin point, I would say, uh, if if you think you're self-made, call your mother. Um, This is not, uh, it's it's just for better or worse, we are, we come from somewhere else. And so the big point I'm making is the American dream is a lie as as it is, as it is understood now that pulling ourselves up from our bootstraps is an impossibility. And it has been since it was coined, it was coined as a joke in 1834, uh, where uh, all the early iterations of it in newspapers were just like it was satire and then suddenly someone believed it was real and we were told to 
pull ourselves up by our bootstraps starting then. And the mythology was created by people we respect today, like Emerson and Thoreau, and by people we respect less, like Horatio Alger, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, I call her Little House on the uh, Propaganda, a Little House of Propaganda, because it's, it's very much about the sort of Pa and Ma doing it themselves. She hated Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was inspired by that. And so you can kind of see that that was actually the point of those books. And generations have come to see uh, the story through some of these uh, thinkers. And then it's continued on in our political life. I mean, everything from um, Herbert Hoover to Ronald Reagan to even the Clintons, um, the things that they, they've uh, said about us having to do everything on our own, that if you depended on any so-called entitlements, you could be considered a welfare queen, um, you know, changing the na nature of welfare as we know it. Um, and so I, I see my book as a, a critique of that and trying to offer ways forward without shame and blame for the ways that we depend on each other in the state. Oh, shame and blame is a, a great uh, segue into Rainsford's book, because um, that book is partly about how we internalize so much. Well, we shame others. You both talk about how um, the philosophy of bootstrapping and the American dream um, lends itself to blaming anyone who um, isn't really very comfortable uh, in the system and certainly people in financial distress. But Rainsford, you talk a lot about how we shame and blame ourselves because we've internalized this, this philosophy and this dream, which is really a con. It is. And I think that it's because the definition of ambition or these kind of offshoots of ambition, like bootstrapping, like high achiever, overachiever, the grind life mentality, all of these kind of synonyms we have around ambition, I think, first of all, they're so narrow and by design are meant to uplift a certain kind of person and a certain kind of ambition while holding everyone else to that standard, conveniently looking about, conveniently forgetting that the fact that by design, our version of what it means to achieve has always been impacted by class by race, by personal preference, by personal circumstance, by things that are so far outside any of our control, even things like grief, moving, having a family, all of these decisions that we make in the day-to-day -day of our lives impact what we strive for, how we strive, as do, of course, the resources we do or do not have to dream, to have ambitions at all, to be able to name those things. And I think one of the things that comes to mind when we talk about shame and blame for me is how early this becomes something that kind of runs through the veins of what it means to be a high achiever young people, children. It's enforced so early in school what it means to be a good student, a good learner, a good listener. And somewhere along the way, I think we've really contorted that to also mean good person. And so, of course, if the only solutions given to you are individual ones, you're going to internalize those and think, well, if I had only studied harder, if I had only done a little bit more, if I had pulled that one all nighter, why can this person next to me manage just fine and I can't? It does become very internalized. And I think that the true, the true shame in that is that we have a bunch of people from a very early point in life internalizing blame that really belongs on the institution and on the systems that they are having to achieve and climb within. Absolutely. And I'll just, um, uh, you will see, uh, you know, this mirrored, but I really like the design of uh, the cover of your book. It has a sort of 3D effect of the gold star stickers. And it, I found it very powerful because um, even at my age, I am 63, I still respond positively to the sight of a gold star. That's <laughs> that's mm -hmm. how well trained we are mm -hmm. to be motivated by um, the game, you know, the so-called re re rewards in the game. Um, and of course, if we're that, you know, if we're so motivated by these kind of rewards and symbols, um, we've also internalized the opposite side, which is 
blaming ourselves and blaming others when it, we aren't lucky or we're not privileged or despite having done everything uh, according to plan, things still don't work out because the system is rigged and and also life. We can't all be winners, right? I think that's another thing you both write about is that the system sets us up to uh, compete with each other. And um, that entire uh, mindset is so incredibly harmful. Yeah, and I feel like that's, I'm arguing for this thing I call arts of interdependence or art of interdependence, because I think we think of dependence or interdependence, either it's like codependent, right? It's like negative or uh, dependent on uh, so-called entitlements like welfare, um, that we're uh, dependent on, uh, children are dependent, right? Um, uh, but I, I, I'm arguing that it takes a lot of skill and craft to be interdependent to be in a family system, to uh, be a colleague, um, to get welfare, to get uh, unemployment. I mean, I wrote about that, it was called the administrative burden, like how much time, the time tax that it takes to get the ne your needs met by your society to get your medical uh, insurance, uh, or you send your kid to summer camp. Um, you know, it, it forms and forms and forms, right? So that's, that's an art. But so is, you know, caring for people, doing work together, mutual aid, workers cooperatives, um, things like participatory budgeting, which is a, a, a relatively new system where people in cities, uh, citizens and cities participate in uh, the allocation of millions sometimes of dollars. And it's taken off in cities around the country. And to me, that was another great example of art, an art of interdependence. These were people who had did sometimes knew nothing about politics. They were just like local folks, and they were learning what it takes to the, create a common wheel. Uh, so I think we need to think of build this up as a set of skills. Uh, and one of the chapters I'm proudest of. It might seem like what is it doing in this in this book? It's it's about in a, what I call inequality therapy, and and that's to try to take individual uh, psych, psychological care out of this individualistic setup because for as far as I can tell like a lot of liberals their version of bootstrapping is self-actualization sometimes and uh, like and this is what uh, Rainsford talks about with burnout like you you and I might not believe that we can do everything on our own economically but we sort of believe probably believe that we can heal ourselves right there's a, there is that or we can uh we can grind through any work assignment right it's not going to be about making it, but it's about completion of task or uh, self-becoming without the aid of a, a counselor or therapist. So what inequality therapist, therapy to me is like things like peer-to-peer -peer counseling or um, even just extreme sliding scale and therapists who are willing to talk about people's financial struggles and not just see them as people who have early trauma or something. And so I talked to a number of people who both participate in these uh, new kinds of therapy or are themselves practitioners. So th there's so many ways to be ar grace gracefully and skillfully dependent on one another, and we, we should take advantage of them. I just have to interject to say that that was one of the most illuminating chapters of your book for me. You should see my copy. It's just like underline after underline because I felt like it finally articulated something that I knew existed. I'd seen it shown up, show up in my own life, this idea that we are going to either hustle or self-esteem our way out of everything. And it's so detrimental. And we know that by now, but it persists because it, it's the allure of individualism. It's the allure that we can do it all on our own and that ambition is enough. And when I first started kind of tentatively picking around with thinking about how I would write about ambition, what else was out there about ambition, something that struck me that I think is related were all of these how-tos on how to make yourself more ambitious 
how to speak up more, how to raise your self-esteem, how to be more confident in your workplace or when you're applying to jobs. And I, I certainly think that there's a place for that kind of advice if people have decided to seek it out. But to me, that misses the larger framing of what we're supposed to be operating within, this very narrow confine of ambition and this idea that really you're still supposed to fix the problem yourself. It's not fixing a problem with your workplace or with the fact that you aren't paid a living wage. Hustle is presented as an opportunity. And I think that that makes it doubly insidious because we have to live with the knowledge that we know we're not going to get there alone. None of our lives are constructed that way. And yet that's what is pushed time and time again. The solution is more work, work a little harder. If you do a little more, you'll be in a better place. Yeah, completely. And I and, and I noted this when I was reading your book too, because like the con of the side hustle is what I call it. And um, it was interesting. We, you talked to mothers who, who and Angela Garbus, who, yeah, uh, I, I just included in our, this, that podcast. I just, that podcast, she's a featured person on that. Um, but like that, especially when you're parenting, that side hustle, that is already a side hustle. So, I mean, beyond side hustle, it is often the central hustle. So the way that parenting makes a lot of these storylines impossible. And that's why they're so, I think they're so masculinist, honestly, because, um, you know, the denial of parenthood of origins and then the denial of the, the burden and the dependence of having a child. So it's on both sides. You kind of have to do that to think that you can hustle and self-esteem your way into, as you put it, into success. Um, and my favorite part of the, my research was finding out all the hypocrisy of some of the wealthiest people today. Um, you know, like Jeff Bezos, you know, his well-to-do parents provided hundreds of thousands of dollars in startup funds. Um, Kylie Jenner said she was uh, self-made and her sister is Kim Kardashian. Her father's an Olympian and, uh, she was on keeping up with the Kardashians, you know, Elon Musk, right? People, some people were saying that he, 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 his father was uh, owned mines, but we, we just know that he did property development, came from a wealthy background. Uh, and according to subsidy track tracker, Tesla received nearly 2.5 billion in federal grants and tax credits. Talk about, you know, dependence. Uh, yet he continues to reject social programs for other people. So I think part of what we need to start doing, one of the solutions is also calling people to account who deny the needs of others when taking and taking for themselves. <laughs> and it's, yeah, uh, it's often people at the very top of the power struggle, structure, struggle, yeah, struggle against the power structure who do that. So that's one of the many, uh, many solutions that um, you recommend in the book, um, which is so helpful. I mean, there's just a very long list. I think another thing that you recommended was. Uh, related to this, which is honesty um, about our own dependence, our own vulnerabilities, um, and the things that uh, we have to give credit to, the things and people that we have to give credit to individually, being honest about that too. Yeah. And I, I thought found that among so many other things in the book really um, helpful because, uh, and Rainsford, I think you're, you're writing reflects a lot of this attitude too that a more uh, you know greater honesty about where we come from who we owe what we need um helps helps move this cultural shift forward that we really need yeah I mean it was um Bob McKinnon, who does a show called attribution he 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 got me thinking about he interviewed me and he was like okay, tell me the people who um, inspired you or supported you when you're young. And I just ha quickly had this thought. I went to Stuyvesant High School, um, which is a public magnet school in Manhattan in the 80s and um, in, into the 90s, early 90s. Oh, but and it, actually just late 80s. But and he, and he, I just thought of Frank McCourt, the novelist's face, because he had been an English teacher there. And he himself is a great example of somebody who would, didn't get all the gold stars until he was 60. You know, he was a high school teacher 
reciting the you know the story the tales of his youth as you know his his hard luck youth in Ireland but he had told me I was a born writer and I was like 13 years old or something and just having him writing all these things on my paper really I mean I I, th I sort of think of him often and that it was good to be able to say that out loud and I I know I'm working on these kind of gratitude mantras but I, I don't know if I can ever comfortably say I'm grateful in a general sense, but I feel like saying grateful for other different other people and being really specific is a lot easier. And is also like, this is a form of self-help, Rainsford. I mean, I don't know if you consider your book that too, but like, I think saying you're speaking your dependence is a form of self-help because you realize that you have a community with you and you're less alone. And that itself is nurturing. It's not just like, Oh, I have to acknowledge all these these other people. <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely. And I think that that's one of the most insidious things about this idea that we earn everything we get to, this idea that we earned it by ourselves. And thus, when we can earn something, owing something or someone giving us something must automatically be a negative thing. And I think that misses so much. It is the greatest honor of my life to owe people, to have people in the boat with me, to have a community that keeps me in check, that helps me, that makes me think about things differently, that's there when I have completely fallen apart, which is something that I talk about fairly extensively in the book. When I was going through a very personal hard time, the thing that I had reached for in the past against all of my better instincts, against everything else I knew and had read and consumed, this idea of ambition, this hard work in the name and in the face of everything, really did not save me. And what did was other people. It was this idea of interdependence, the idea not just that we lean on each other, but that we can ask each other for things and furthermore that we should. And I, I just love how that came through every line of your book, the idea that interdependence is the thing that can carry us. It's the thing that carries each other. Yeah, and it is. And, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, the girl boss thing, right? I feel like I was screaming in the wilderness and now everybody knows, but like there was a moment where I was just kind of, you know, my particular hatred is for lean in, but it, it widens out to another set of these kind of girl bosses because that was part of the, I mean, I saw it as a betrayal of, of parts of the feminist movement too, that this is like, instead of thinking about having a collective consciousness, we're thinking about, you know, how to succeed, how to get individuals who are probably going to lose their jobs for doing this to aggressively ask for <laughs> raises, you know, when they, when they're, when they're not in demand, you know, when, when the labor market wasn't hot. Um, and I just think that that's, that's, that's depressing, actually, that that kind of self-help is depressing. Whereas, you know, yeah, this kind of interdependent, uh, radical self-help is to me, at least a lot less depressing. Um, I think of um, my uh, colleague, my dear colleague who just passed away, Barbara Ehrenreich, um, you know, her book Bright Sided was this really incredible, and again, way before its time, almost 20 years ago, takedown of this kind of self-help. And the fact that it still lingers and <laughs> people have not been as critical of it as they should, but I think they're starting to learn. I think the pandemic showed that you, again, I like that self-esteem is a verb, that you can't self-esteem your way out of this stuff. It's just not, it's not enough. But I certainly hope that we, um, as, as Barbara Ehrenreich wrote in her book, um, where she wrote about the whole sort of positive thinking about cancer industry, um, I hope that we understand that um, we can't cure COVID through positive thinking. And that maybe, <clears throat> maybe uh, we, both books really argue for a sort of, change in the way that we think in the United States about our system and about um, about each other. And they're both very timely because they reference where we are now. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, this is a, a conversation that sort of uh, snowballs. We certainly need it. Rainsford, in your book, you um, address your own generation's situation. And, yet, and you've done that in your other writing, um, which is very relevant. And I've, I've been thinking a lot about 
I'm a parent of a daughter who's about your age and reading both books, I thought a lot about um, the relative privilege of white middle-class people when I, you know, 30 years ago for me um, and how that compares with where we are now. I do think it is, I, I think this is a harder, at this time in history, it's much harder to crack the American system you know, I can't speak to whether it's harder, although I think that we could argue it certainly seems that way, but I do think that there is a very unique amount of pressure on young people today. And honestly, I, even less than my generation, I'm a millennial, I'm 29. Um, my younger sister's generation has a whole other set of expectations that to me just seem completely unfathomable and completely unrealistic. I think that, you know, what began as pressure to have your life figured out at college graduation time, assuming that everyone goes to the same kind of college and goes on the same timeline has kind of dropped that age lower and lower. You need to have it all figured out by 18. You need to have it all figured out by 16. I think that we have future planned America's youth out of a childhood and out of a young adulthood. And I think that part of the reason that that happens in the context of this idea of ambition and bootstrapping is because we still feed this myth in school and later, but I think it starts very early in school that all you have to do is work hard. And if you work as hard as you can, there's going to be a good result at the end of that, even if you don't know what you want the good result to be, even if it's a little bit more complicated than getting an A or being accepted to a certain school. And I think that it does immeasurable amounts of harm, especially honestly, when we zoom back and look at where we are as a country right now. And even just if we isolate that to the past couple years alone, what young people have been expected to come of age in and largely do that without any acknowledgement that they are first and foremost human beings too, who are impacted by all of this trauma, who are impacted by lost jobs, their own or their parents, being paid below a minimum wage, not being able to pay rent. All of these things impact how someone makes the way, their way through the world. And so for us to act like that's somehow separate from how they feel about themselves as they're being expected to do all of these things, I think just really misses the mark. I think all the time about a young person I spoke to who was talking about very well-meaning people giving her advice when she was in college. If you fail, what's the worst that could happen? It's a no, it's an F, it's okay. And she told me very clearly and very candidly that, you know, no, the worst thing that could happen if she fails is that she drops out and she can no longer afford to retake the class that she needs to graduate because she doesn't make enough at her job to put herself through that class again. And I think as long as we ignore the systemic and structural stakes that young people are up against and act like this narrative of, the bright young people there to claim the future is enough absent any sort of structural help. I think we're, I think we're really letting them down. Alyssa, you're a parent. And... <laughs> yeah, I'm listening to this like, um, you know, it is a worse time. I, you know, I'm not going to lie. Student loan debt is 1.7 trillion. Uh, you know, I, I know that they, they, they Biden just, uh, pass that student loan forgiveness, but that that's being tied up in the courts. Uh, fewer than half of American adults uh, say they have enough emergency funds to cover three months of expenses, according to Pew. This is in 2020. Like this is not. Uh, it's not even the America I grew up in, which was you know whatever, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so I feel like. Part of this is acknowledging that and uh, yeah, making these structural shifts, but also acknowledging that to ourselves and each other, you know, so in my last book, I mean, having a kid made this really important, like talking about where you're at financially uh, with your kid, with people, other parents, if you need to, to explain why you can't do pickup because you don't have a babysitter. I mean, this comes up. <laughs> You know, and um, maybe you could pool, carpool or what have you, right? You have to work. Maybe some other parents don't, but like, and to be really explicit because this is not an easy America right now. Um, and from the, my last book was called Squeeze and it was about a lot of middle-class families and and a lot of the, 
the secrecy that circled around their feelings of precarity. And my advice there is the same as the advice here. In some ways, it's just like, explain, be honest. You know, my daughter would be like, why is there that homeless person? And also, why can't we live in that giant house? Or, you know, <laughs> and and I'd have to explain, well, that's somebody who's experiencing homelessness and maybe they didn't have family support at some point or other. And that giant house, they definitely did have family support. And this is how inherited wealth works. <laughs> of course, you're like, you're like, God, you do that with a nine-year-old? But like, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's, again, this is part of the radical self-help. I feel like living in truth is really important, especially around financial matters and that people are more secretive about that than they are about sex. Um, and that that's part of it, like acknowledging that mobility numbers have were, you know, in 1940, the, the mobility, the somebody born in 1940, their, their mobility was uh, their chance of reproducing their parents' successes was 92%. And somebody born in the eighties, their chance of reproducing, it was like less than 50%. So that's like, it's just hard numbers out there, you know, and I hope both of us like talking to people, showing the lived reality on the ground of some of those numbers makes people feel common cause like, oh, okay, I have that, those feelings, and, which is part of why in Bootstrapped, I have interviewed people who depend on GoFundMe for their medical bills, but I also interviewed a former girl boss <laughs> and, or, you know, I up and down the gradient a little to show that this this ideology hurts people at different ends of the, the monetary spectrum. I mean, it even hurts the wealthy because the wealthier, uh, I mean, hurts them, it, but it, it keeps them in a, in a empty and disassociated place as citizens, which is part of why there's movements now towards uh, a different kind of philanthropy uh, that, and a different kind of transparency about your wealth. And I talked to people who posted their tax returns online who were very wealthy and that that was an effort to show how much they benefited from the tax system and i thought well that's really brilliant that's yeah yeah it, it it's it's great and it uh it, going back to it's uh, everything in these books connects you know the personal and the political and the structural all, all uh connect to each other very well <clears throat> that takes me back to um our discussion about acknowledging um, the help that you get, your uh, the privileges that you might have, encouragement, and um, I I was thinking about that, um, having read both books and thinking about the structural things that that were an advantage to me. Going back to the GI Bill, made a huge difference in my family, and I think there was an entirely different trajectory for us because of that one thing. I mean, I changed, it changed our, our class status. You know, when I was born, I was born, uh, my parents were suddenly middle class after having been born into the depression. I would love to see that sort of awareness spreading in the United States that we understand um, what, you know, when we, when we have advantages or privileges that we understand where they came from. Yeah. And I mean, one of the reasons I wrote this book was I get, I get this hate mail sometimes from running the economic hardship reporting project, which is this journalism nonprofit, either directed at our organization or directed in the comments section to our writers, you know, that's like, right. Don't read the comments. Like, but they're often, they're, they're, they're always like, you know, why did she have two kids? Why did she have three kids? You know, either about the subjects of articles or about the writers themselves. Why did they go to college? Why did they go to college? <laughs> you know, why did they own their house? Why did they own? It's it's like it's constantly what aboutism about other people's lives um, because it's almost like I feel like sort of sometimes the way that we stigmatize Ill, people who are ill, it's like some they must have done something, and that's a way to it's sort of protecting ourselves and throwing our fellow citizens under the bus, right? Saying like, oh, there's, there, there's no such thing as student debt. And there's no such thing as, you know, toxic masculinity that might lead to having multiple partners. <laughs> I don't know, you know, um, and that it's always somebody's will. That's just, you know, their will that's to, for due to their success or their failure. So um, that those notes and the, those comments really riled me up and got me started on this project. Cause I was like, I've got to show the 
connect the dots around this and show that the, a lot of the people that were being attacked were do, being done unfairly. That that really resonated with me too. I think one of our, you know, a huge national issue, but a big uh, local issue in Seattle is um, housing and homelessness. And I cannot tell you, I monitor um, my mother's next door account. I cannot tell you how many. <laughs> oh. Well, it's magical thinking, isn't it? The, yeah. The, the magical thinking is that somehow you can make, by shaming and blaming people, you can make economic conditions go away. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that works, but it's a very uh, widespread activity and belief. Yeah, but also that you've done something right. Mm -hmm. So right. that's like, you'd feel superior. Uh, the reader can feel, um, and I, they'd all, I would often get these notes that were sort of like, yeah, we scrimped and staved like these totally pleasureless and hedonic lives. These people, <laughs> you never, we never went out to dinner. We had a one falling down truck. Why is this writer insisting on going to college? Um, yeah, so. Well, that that reminds me of the brain spread. I think you have a quite a lot of discussion in your book about um, fun, about <laughs> how that is having fun, connecting with people. Um, making designing your life so that you have ordinary human pleasures is actually one of the solutions to this um, insidious kind of psychological bind that ambition gets us in. I think it says so much about the bind that ambition gets us in that we have to name something as simple as you deserve to have fun end of sentence not you deserve to have fun if your grades are perfect. Once you've logged this many hours at work, once you've done X, Y, Z, check off whatever achievement you want from that list, then you've earned rest or pleasure or joy or human connection. And I think that it does so, it takes so many things to the darkest possible place because number one, it renders all of those things completely transactional that joy and play, that connection, all of these things that we know are foundational to how we make our way through the world as people, it kind of makes them prizes to be won at the end of this hustle. And I think that that's really demoralizing for people. I think that that's a sad way to think about enjoying yourself or connecting with another human being. And I think number two, it makes it incredibly isolating that we have these things as tokens of achievement rather than things that we all deserve your ability to experience pleasure and comfort and connection should not be tied to your ambition, your economic standing, your job title, all of these things that we think are even trades, they aren't. These are things that we are all deserving of. And I think that that's one of the things that I think about all the time when I hear comments about, well, you know, no one canceled my student debt. I had to work really hard to pay it off. And the thing that I think of when I hear those comments is, have you ever thought that you shouldn't have had to work that hard either, that it was broken all along? And now we have an opportunity to do something about it. We have an opportunity to do something about so many things, but just because something was broken in the past and impacted us negatively, I don't think that that's reason to criticize attempts to solve it or to make it better. And I think that that's kind of getting out of that individual mindset of everything I've, good in my life I have, I've earned all by myself. No, we didn't. And thank no. goodness we didn't because what a lonely, miserable existence that would be. I think the interdependence that, that Alyssa's book explores so beautifully is at the heart of all of it. It's a better way to live with one another. Yeah. And also, I mean, I think eviction moratorium is sort of a similar thing, right? Why should these people get their rent paid, right? It's like this constant um, tit for tat, uh, the kind of societal tit for tat that we need to get out of. Um, but I was going to ask you a question, Rainsford, which is what was the best way that you feel like you detox yourself from ambition? And if you could think of like one or two ways that like you personally, what did you do, you know? 
That that's a great question. I think that one of the interesting things about my own relationship to ambition is that I was somebody that for a lot of my life wanted to be a quote unquote high achiever very badly. And for most of my life really missed the mark on that. I, I try to be very transparent about the fact that I was not a star student. I dropped out of college after my freshman year and took a couple years off and then went back online. Like it was a little bit more convoluted than at the time I wanted it to be. And speaking of shame, I felt so much shame around that. I was like, I can't even get, take, take the achievements out. I can't even get the striving right. And so that was a little bit disorienting. And I think the later I got into my twenties, I went through a phase where I was already reading and thinking and having conversations with people that were shifting the way I thought about myself in relation to the world, because I think that one of the things that is so dark about this kind of individualistic ambition is that you find yourself holding yourself to standards that I would never popularly ascribe to the large swath of people. Those would never be expectations I had for a friend that, oh, you are only worthy if you do X, Y, Z. That's not how I think of the world, but had somehow really compartmentalized myself in that way of thought. And it wasn't until kind of a total breakdown of my physical and mental health all at once, kind of rethinking work and going, what on earth is all of this for? At the end of the day, what is the purpose of all of this to make me think, there has to be a different way to approach this. And I think that in the aftermath of all of those things where I was so privileged to even be in a position to reconsider what ambition looked like for me, but I think in the aftermath of all of those things, it came through loud and clear that what saved me was not taking on one more project. It was not striving. It was not working a little harder. Honestly, it wasn't even doing work that felt personally fulfilling. It was other people. It was other people who thought that I was enough as I was and was a good friend, sister, community member, regardless of any kind of output. And I think from there, it led me into conversations with those people about how they were approaching things like ambition or dreams or what they were working toward. And I found on the other side of that, a collective idea of what it means to strive for one another, for our best interest to not be individual, but to be about each other, that kind of re-clarified how I think about my own ambition and how I think about all the things that ambition can mean. And if I can, I, I also have a question for you, um, because at the end of your book, one of my favorite parts, you talk about the need to rewrite our own narratives, which has been so much of what our conversation is about today, rewriting our own narratives about achievement and attainment. How have you rewritten yours over the course of your life and career? Uh, oh God, I don't think I have. I mean, it's so funny. I feel like, but I'm not going to get into a whole, um, again, like, God, I'm not, um, being communitarian properly, <laughs> Like I'm not like bootstrapping that, you know, like that would be the ultimate thing for me to get into. I have to, I have to not do that. I mean, I had a specific kind of um, bootstrapping. I was very like, I was like, I was a good student. I was kind of a, a very, I wrote a book about this called Hot House Kids that was about prodigy and, and giftedness. And so I did feel like I had to sing for my supper on some level as like a person, a human being. And uh, I won all these like prizes when I was a kid. And that was a lot of, around writing, right? And so that was a lot around uh, kind of this disassociation from the thing I loved most. It had to be always about, at that point is poetry. It had to be, you know, for some kind of glory. It wasn't for, it wasn't unto itself. I do feel like it's become more unto itself, the process of writing. I'm not sure the process of living has, you know, that I feel like I need to work on that more. And I mean, all kinds of things like parenting, you can get kind of very, um, you know, it, it's a very confusing thing, like how to model ambition for your kids, how to how to parent properly and around that, you know, I mean, I've just last night was a epic battle around homework that, you know, had some of those elements to it, right? Like, I should probably just be like, you do you <laughs> to my 11 year old, but instead I'm like, where's your math homework? This problem? No, you haven't gotten the mode right. You know, like, oh my God, this is just, um, so yeah, so how do we rewrite the narrative of our lives? I mean, I think for me, uh, the, running my organization has been very powerful because 
it is really about community. And I did also have this incredible relationship with Barbara Ehrenreich that was um, almost like a shadow familial kind of relationship, you know? Um, I, she was a pretty ambitious person too in her own way. But um, having that collective consciousness, she definitely had that. She was definitely a we, a we kind of person. I mean, she collaborated with other women, she collaborated with me. Um, and that that collaboration and then collaboration with people I work with and then with all the different writers and filmmakers and photographers we we work with, I think that's really been pretty transformative in the sense like I, I can honestly say that I feel like I'm part of a movement, um, which is not something that I ever felt when I was just an author, you know, in my little room. I didn't feel like even when I was out reporting, I never felt like, oh, yes, I'm part of a kind of um, moment in history or something. Um so that's that's a that is one of the ways I've re-narrativized, I guess. That's a very that's a good place for us to sort of start thinking about um, leaving our conversation and going forward because you 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 both give uh, the reader a lot of uh, inspiration to um, once we understand the insidiousness of. Um, the philosophy in the United States and uh, it's capitalism really but it's our own particular American um, flavor of it how we you provide a lot of uh, ideas and hope and direction in how we we think that how we go forward with other people I mean they're ju just a you know a long list of um of uh, recommendations like we've talked about some personal things but there's all sorts of um, prompts for organizing um, supporting people paying their fair share in all sorts of different ways like their fair share of taxes there's mutual aid workers co-ops support activists support other activists um, what else do we have here I mean, it's it's a very, very long list. So I think readers have to go to the books. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more public reaction to the books. They're coming out in March and June. Is that right? Okay, that's great. And uh, where are you located? I'm in Seattle, Washington. Oh, Seattle, that's right. You mentioned that. Yeah, where are you all? see you on we'll see you on our travels yeah oh do uh do come see us on your travels and i hope that you too do uh i don't know maybe at that point you can your your book tours can uh interconnect <laughs> yeah i'd love it yeah it's great to meet you both thank you so much it was really thank fun yeah <laughs> thank you for such a great conversation i'm yeah to get to talk to both of you Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you again. Bye. Bye.